And then we have Satoshi Fujiwara, who is a Kobe-born Berlin-based photographer who was actually recommended to me by um, uh, juxtaposition alumni, Shumon Bazaar, uh, the editor and curator who spoke here uh, last semester, because they worked together on a couple of exhibitions. So I'm, I'm very mm, curious about actually his work too, and I haven't met him before. And then there's Maria Ines Plaza Lasso, who is a friend and an editor and a writer and cultural critic who started, or is one of the co-founders of the magazine Arts or the journal Arts of the Working Class, which you probably all know from living in the city, um, which is like a benef benefit newspaper for those that are selling it. Um, so she's going to um, talk about her trajectory and her kind of life path, and then we have which I'm very excited about, Bonaventure, so Beijing Nidi Kung uh, with us, who um, has founded the Savi Contemporary in Berlin many, many years ago and is since recently the director of the HKW in Berlin. And we've known each other for a very, very long time. And he's going to join us, not so much in a presentation, but rather a dialogue. So it's going to be us two having a conversation with you guys. Um, but it's, um, it's fantastic that he, he, he's taking the time. I'm very excited about this. And then we have Camille Enraud. Uh, Camille Enraud is an artist that I absolutely adore, French artist. This might be the only session where we will invite her online while everything is happening in persona. It's not yet clear whether it's going to be here or we invite her via um, an online stream. In any case, it works out uh, always well. And then we have, as the last uh, session in February, um, uh, Phoebe, Wal Phoebe Wal Walton, yes, and, um, and uh, Jacob Humbert from Forensics of Forensic Architecture, a research group of forensic architecture you maybe know, originally founded by E.L. Weizmann uh, in London, and their group of yeah, a transdisciplinary group of architects, engineers, scientists, journalists who um, explore or try to investigate current political topics by analyzing usually social media. I, I don't know if anyone is familiar already with their practice, um, but they, what I find really fascinating, they might have a piece shown in an exhibition context, art context, while this exact same piece is used in a court case. Um, and that's an interesting kind of bridge there um, they're able to, to kind of build. Um, so I'm very curious about uh, learning also from them. So this is kind of the program for us, for, um, for the juxtapositions. And um, there's also um, a brand new website called juxtapositions.net. And there you can see all of the past lectures as well. So you can just kind of scroll through. So juxtapositions.net, we launched it just a couple of weeks ago um, with the links and the bio of it, each of the presenters that you saw before in the slides. And it's a wonderful archive of knowledge that's in there. So I really, really recommend you to kind of check it out. Maybe you find some that one you're interested in. But we had um, such an incredible lineup of people here and I'm very proud that we have it now all on one platform, no? very easily um, available and approachable for everyone. But again, alternating with this, so in a week from now on, uh, on Monday I will be introducing the Healing Arts, um, which is a also a lecture series or more a dialogue series that I initiated together with the um, International Society for Arts and Medicine, which I'm a founding member of in the Charité uh, Berlin. And that's incredibly um, exciting for me because it's also new terrain. And what we are exploring there is the interrelationship between arts and health. Mm -hmm. And for me, this started a couple of years ago when I came across uh, a report by the WHO, the World Health Organization, um, from 2019 on arts and health, and it's a quantitative case study report. Quantitative versus uh, qualitative means that um, they're looking really at data. Qualitative report means how do people feel, etc. but really looking at data. 600 plus case studies, and very simply speaking, or breaking it down, the result was art heals. And that's pretty incredible. Um, and. Uh, what it said is that the passive experience or the active 
doing of uh, creative artistic practice um, fosters well-being and health. That means uh, I read a book or uh, I go to a concert or I go to a museum or to a theater play or a movie or actually I write a book or I, I paint a painting or I dance or I sing in the choir and it, uh, it helps for any, any physical um, 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 psychological uh, chronic quote-unquote disease. So there's a lot of, and this was, became even more um, dominant during the uh, pandemic and questions of mental health, but realizing how important actually culture and the arts are for, for us, for, for us to be good, and for us to be safe. But it's new to me too, and it's also generally new. And here we have um, always um, the format of a dialogue. For example, the first session First guest will be um, Professor Dr. Stefan Willig, who is the director of the Institute for Social Medicine at the Charité since 20 plus years and is um, also um, leading a research group in art and medicine, but he's also trained as a violinist and he's a conductor conducting the World Doctors Orchestra and he was also the director of the Hans Eisler Music School for many years. So super transdisciplinary in, in his uh, his background already, and he's going to meet with Ayumi Powell, um, a wonderful artist here based in Berlin, who is a trained violinist, professional violinist, but entered into the fields of art with her practice. Had a fantastic um, piece at the Martin Gropius Bau um, recently. So each of them going to give like really short, like maybe 15 minute presentations of what they do, and then it's going to be a moderated conversation between the two. And the week after, we have Benno Brinkhaus, who's also at the Charité and uh, with a focus on kind of alternative uh, medicine. And Edna Bonhomm, who is a science of hist uh, scientist of, no, historian of science, uh, apologies. And she's focusing in particular on um, kind of Afro-diasporic healing practices here in Germany. Then we have Mazda Adli, who um, has a, a background in psychology, also at the Charité. He also started a group called Neuro-Urbanism, where he invited like psychologists and urbanists and architects to work together. And he's going to meet with DJ Gigola, or Paulina Schulz, who you might know, who is a trained medical doctor. In fact, when I got my first vaccination, um, no? uh, during the pandemic, it was actually her, <laughs> by coincidence, that vaccinated me. So this is kind of uh, some of them. So we have Anne Berghöfer, who is um, a psychiatrist at the Charité, um, coming together with Prem Krishnamurti, who is a dear friend and a curator and a designer, who has um, curated the last Ohio Triennial, which very much was about mental health or um, yeah, health in general in the city. Uh, Dr. Friedemann Schad from the Havelhöhe Hospital. It's an anthroposophic hospital here in Berlin kind of behind Spandau, um, who is meeting with Professor Dr. Susanne Bauer, who is here at the UDK um, uh, teaching um, music therapy or art therapy. And um, then as the last kind of couple, it's Ada Primoradi Sehuli. She has a background in cultural studies from the Humboldt University and is a doctor uh, and a psychiatrist at the Charité and has worked working a lot on literature and uh, healing. And she's meeting with Natasha Kelly, who you might, if you also just started, know as the visiting professor for cultural studies in the Studium Generale. So also super fucking exciting juxtapositions that are happening here um, on Monday. So just mark Monday at 6. Yeah? You, you're going to leave with new information and hopefully very inspired every time. But to kind of round up the whole thing, what I also do here, who of you are master students or in the kind of towards the end? Okay, also a good bunch. Um, so um, this is um, um, a program that I've been offering for also two years now, and that's a colloquium for master students who are either kind of coming to the final project or working on a bigger project, and they are looking for a space where they get, let's say, heterogeneous feedback. So we started this morning, and we're about 20, 25 students from architecture to art, product design to fashion design, GVK to visual communication, experimental film to composition, but also as uh, students of psychology and art therapy and um, psychiatry, so from totally different universities. And it's a very beautiful, smaller setting, a kind of safe space, a brave space to 
kind of pitch your ideas to a group and, and get feedback outside of your bubble. It's uh, very, very dear. So if you're interested in master student, approach me. We just started. Um, and there the idea is, it's called Post Protocol, so after Beyond Standard Protocol, it's the breakfast club because we meet Monday mornings at 10 o'clock, kind of the first, first thing in the, in the week, but it's also obviously inspired by the iconic movie, and it's, um, I always say, for those that would do the mooning on the picture here, so it's, if you don't fully fit in whatever you are studying, then you fit really well to us. Um, so, uh, and this means that I um, very much believe in disciplines and also expertise in disciplines, but I also believe that we really have to learn to communicate and talk to people outside of our domain. And another thing, just because it was so fresh, I just um, published a book that's based basically on student works, Weak Signals, that was a seminar I did for two semesters and it's published by Spectre Books, and this is a beautiful glossary of A to Z of new narratives in art and technology. Um, but this is how also a seminar can end in a properly done book. Um, so this is this semester. Uh, this is what um, I'm offering here. And um, as I said in the beginning, I, um, I, I always struggle with um, what do I do because I can't always give the same lecture. So on this website, juxtaposition.net, you can literally watch one, two, three, four semesters of me giving this introduction. And the first part is obviously telling um, about um, what uh, this semester uh, will be happening. And, um, and then the other one is me showing you what I do, my work, or something like that. And I did this, and I felt like it's boring. Then the last semester, uh, it's worthwhile watching. I did a um, presentation of all these different like theoretical concepts. Yeah, what to them, no? Oops. Where is this coming from? Um, this, um, all these different theoretical concepts that, uh, um, that kind of inspired me and where you have to kind of situate everything that we're talking about. And this time around, uh, this was basically scrolling down my, my website to kind of show you the different stuff that I do. Um, and what I do is I work as a mediator. Yeah, so I work as a curator in the widest sense. I have a background in, I studied philosophy and comparative religious studies and ethnology in Berlin at the FU and also in Rome at La Sapienza. Um, so I never studied art. I actually, I tried, I wanted to apply to the UDK and I chickened out. I never dared. I turned around and never did it, but I always wanted to. So um, here I am again, but um, you made it. You definitely step ahead of me. Um, but I ended up becoming a curator, so really working um, on exhibitions, um, uh, on books, on symposia, on courses. So curating, for the lack of a better word, actually, I'm trying to bring topics and people together in certain contexts and uh, kind of reflect upon things. And um, showing you all my work is fun, and you can actually go through the, um, the previous lectures. So this time I thought I'll do something that I wanted to propose as a lecture series here, and it might not work out at all, or it might work out. And this is inspired by. So I was always thinking it would be great to invite people to give a talk, not at all about their work, but what inspired them. Because sometimes, actually, that's much more interesting than the work itself. And to really understand where do people come from. Uh, what, what drove them to do that, what, what's the ecstasy of influences behind that. And I was influenced um, by this quote by Virgil Abloh, you probably have seen it, everything I do is for my 17-year-old 17, 17 version of myself. Anyone heard this before? It was like a shy one person. Okay, are you familiar with the work of Virgil Abloh? Okay, there's a few more. So he was a designer uh, who recently passed away, um, who was head of Louis Vuitton then at, towards the end, who started off-white and um, was trained as an architect and an engineer, and then went into kind of graphic design, did a lot in the early years for Kanye West, and then became a, kind of a product designer and eventually fashion designer, and then into the kind of high fashion industry. But he was always stood for totally transgressing disciplinary boundaries, or kind of not um, f adhering to the systems as, as they're made. And I, I was very moved when he said everything that I do is basically for the 17-year-old me. And then I realized it's true because these kind of first 17 years, 
actually very foundational. Just think about it yourself. Like all the stuff that inspired you in these years will stay with you for a long time. They might get more profound, some stuff you throw overboard, but it's, it's, it's a real core, uh, core error that's the kind of defining anything you do, and also your artistic whatever practice you're doing. So I thought I'll do a tour of inspirations from zero to 17. So I'll share with you what I've never done before. Inspir you will hear nothing of my work, but only the stuff that inspired me. And this is also for you to think about what inspires you and why did you end up here. The fact that you all made it to UDK, that you took the effort, you took all these kind of hurdles to make it through here, but why? Why are you doing this? You're obviously aware, if you're at the UDK, you entered a very precarious future. It's not like you are making, will be making a lot of cash if you study here at the UDK, no? It's, that's for sure not the case. So, like, really question yourself, why? Like, what influenced me? Why am I here? And I uh, applaud it. I applaud it, applaud it, because the creative mind, uh, the creative thinking people is what's dearly, dearly needed in the world that we're living in today. But, so, let's start with how I grew up and where I grew up. Uh, I was born in the late 70s in West Berlin, so you were all born probably in the 90s, most of you, or even 2000s. Who was born in the 90s? Who was born in the 2000s? Okay. Who was born in the 80s? When? Who was born in the 70s? <laughs> okay, so I'm the only one. Um, good, so I'm born late 70s. Most of you, as I saw, is 2000s. Um, so this is long, long after the war came down. But I grew up in a city that was really divided. So this is just Berlin. This is Berlin in the 80s, and it's, this is how the city looked like. So every time that we went on vacation to Italy in the summer, we had to drive for three hours to the DDR, and we were not allowed to step out of the car and kind of make it to the other side. So we were this really, really weird little island West Germany and kind of the Red Sea, so to speak, all around us. And it was only half of the city. But this is the context that I grew up in, in, in West Berlin. And I grew up uh, not only in this kind of political context, but I realized long after that I grew up with kids' books. Are you familiar with this one? Still working? Are you also familiar with Seraphine and Seine Wundermaschine? No? Okay, so it's interesting. So I, I did this analysis a couple of years ago. All the kids' books that I grew up with were very revolutionary in tone. So Baba Papa, if you remember the story, they kind of, um, they live in the garden of these two kids in their house. The pavilion that they live in kind of breaks apart and they doesn't fit and they find an abandoned house and they paint it and it becomes theirs and then these... A um, new construction company comes, tears down the house, they live in a modern flat, they don't like it, they live in a tent, and eventually they build their own, like, Barbara Papa kind of thing. And then they fight against all the bulldozers. But it's like, literally from Hausbesetzung, like um, living in abundant houses, to creating your own home in this kind of alternative community and fighting against the system in kids' books, if you think about it. And the same was with Seraphine. It's these two guys who kind of uh, inherit an old ruin and they make this amazing building out of it. It was just my dream as a kid, like most influential picture of my childhood probably. And there's many more examples actually all across all countries and all cultures of kids' books of the 70s that are inherently political and they address urban topics. You don't find that anymore. Now I have two kids uh, at completely different ages. There was no political or urban discourse whatsoever in these books. But this, this had a profound influence on me. And another really, really big one is, you probably all read Donald Duck as well, but what was most inspiring, do you remember this book here? Yeah, I see a few heads nodding. So I'm, I'm a complete book nerd. I love books. Like, I'm addicted to books. And, uh, and I think it all started with a Schlauer Buch, like the kind of all-knowing book by, by the Boy Scouts of the... Um, Nephews of Donald Duck. It's called the Schlau Buch in Finland Fieserschweif, but it was basically like the whole Earth catalog. It was this one thing where all information was bundled in there and gave me an idea of what there is a book that kind of has all the knowledge in it. And basically, I've been looking for that book my entire life or making a lot of books into this, this one book. But it really triggered an understanding of 
there is an object, a book that you can open up and you'll find all the answers to everything. Tricky. And my entire general education is also thanks to Disney. This doesn't exist anymore, but it was goofy as, I don't know, uh, Galileo Galilei, Galilei, Beethoven, Tut and Tier Moon, uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Frankenstein, you name it. It was like a Disney version of, let's say, large cultural figures. And I would say until probably 18, this was the grounding of my proper education, like my humanistic education is thanks to Goofy. But it's also, imagine, this is for you old school stuff, but I was six years old when this movie um, showed, the third Return of the Jedi, and I watched it in the cinema and was way too young, I think, for watching it in the cinema. But this shit lives, leaves imprints, no? There's this whole kind of another alternative world and um, sci-fi world that opened up there. <coughs> And MAD, does anyone still know MAD? There's like a very half an arm over there. Anyone else? Never heard of it? Okay, good, a second one. So these were like these comic books for kids or teenagers in the 80s, particularly 70s, 80s. Eventually, became the, guy, the editor became the editor of um, Titanic many years later. And they kind of picked up on cultural relevant topics or latest movies and did their kind of twist uh, of it in a very kind of dark, humoristic approach. But my entire sense of humor is based on these kind of comics. And I got them from my bigger brother and read them at a way too early age. But they, this, this stuff leaves imprints. Goonies. Anyone knows this one? Yes, best movie ever. There's probably no movie I've watched more times than Goonies. You know, adventure stories, kids find a treasure map and they go out on the hunt. Um, it's, it's beautiful. Along with this one, Stand By Me. So this is still my style directory <laughs> until now. And I was probably 10 when I watched this in the cinema. So it's, it's a coming of age story. It's a River Phoenix, probably also my first role model. At 10, I thought this is the coolest fucking guy ever. And this, uh, and also the whole, I don't know, even style-wise, style I'm, I'm still following River Phoenix at the age of 10. And, um, and it stayed, it totally stayed. And uh, I, I realized, this, realized this only many years later. But these four boys that uh, are coming of age and they're finding, they're looking for a dead body. Um, set in, I don't know, in the USA in the 60s. But as a kid, um, this for my generation, you that is born in the 80s, do you know this guy? No, so he this even earlier, that's called Sievers, the fallout guy. And this was every boy my age, at around six, seven, eight, wanted to be a stuntman. That does not exist anymore. Probably most people don't even know what a stuntman is. But the whole TV show on this dude in the middle um, with this kind of bit dorky assistant and his kind of hot chick assistant to the side, and he was a stuntman. And this was basically what every, like literally everyone in my kindergarten wanted to become, as a stuntman. And MacGyver. Oh, I see a little bit more here. And that's kind of also interesting character because he's half humanitarian worker, half scientist, half engineer, half super spy. But this kind of solving the world uh, with a Swiss blade is um, something that also stayed. And it's a very DIY approach to things, you know, that you can actually hack systems to very complex issues. You might have a very simple solution with just a Swiss blade. And um, kind of a collage approach, like a bricolage, basically. And then musically speaking, I, um, again, um, uh, I, when I grew up, um, tapes were still around. And when we did very long trips in the car to the south in the summer to Italy, um, there were no seat belts, by the way. No, I grew up with a father smoking in the car and no seat belts. And, and there were only three cassette tapes that were in the car. Nothing else. And this is what you listen to for 16 hours, basically. And there was Bob Dylan, Desire, Ella and Louise, and Leonard Cohen. And this also was ingrained in my mind and kind of still stayed with me. And then I had a cousin who was, um, uh, was caught by the police because he threw stones at police officers. And he was really an active punk at the time, 80s. And then he stayed with us. Um, and this is how he avoided going to jail. And he gave me the first Kraftwerk tape deck. And he gave me also my first bullet, and he <laughs> showed me how to draw skulls. But contextualized the whole thing, then happened Chernobyl. 
Chernobyl, maybe you know it from the TV series that came out a couple of years ago, was the first huge um, uh, um, radioactive um, disaster in, in Europe, as in, in Russia, Ukraine, Ukraine sorry, um, that um, kind of had an impact on everyone, so to speak. Also that day, it's one of these things where you, you have your 9-11s, etc., where you know what you did on that day, but this day all the parents came and picked us up because it was raining. You were not allowed to be outside when it rained because of the radioactive matter. So playing in the garden was not allowed anymore, going outside was not allowed anymore. Um, but this is just thrown in between because besides all of that, all the other stuff happens. This is, you're a kid, you don't really realize except for you can't go out. Fat Boys, incredible group, doesn't exist anymore, made fantastic movies. And then stuff like this, then um, there was this thing in the late 80s. Uh, did you, any, any of these movies familiar? So 80s was Jean-Claude Van Damme was the fucking shit, man. He was the shit. With Blood Sports and other movies, or Kurt Russell here in Big Trouble in Little China, where kind of martial arts became really a thing and influenced it. And then I got older, you kind of past 10, 11, 12, is when suddenly new music came in. Suicidal Tendencies, LA-based, like punk, incredible group. And skateboarding became a very big thing. And I'm telling you all of this because none of this it has disappeared. It's still heavily influential to all that I do and how I approach things. And I realized this in preparing this lecture, that this is not just I'm just sharing, you know, I'm talking out of my private memories, but this is stuff that is still ingrained in my work. It's not theoretical work, it's not conceptual. All that came much later, when, when I was older than 18. But all the aesthetics, the understanding of it, is here. It's already set in these first 17 years. So skateboarding brought across also a whole new visual culture. Thrasher magazine was an incredible magazine just for the graphic design of it, the visuals of it. And it was a super important source. Also, now, again, we're speaking, this is 1989. No social media, no internet, no nothing. This was the source of information, magazines, like cutting edge magazines for the style, for the looks, but also for the content. And at the same year, uh, something incredible happened in Berlin, namely the wall came down. So um, me being whatever, 13, um, going to the Brandenburg Gate on the 9th of November, and I must be one of these persons standing on top of the wall is me because um, my parents put me up there. But as being part of a historic moment where also a city completely changed and became something new. Historical backdrop. Um, around the same time, a year later, uh, this was the first album that I bought from my own money, from my own pocket money. And um, I could elaborate an entire evening lecture only on this album because it's a masterpiece um, of sampling. It's the, one of the albums with the most samples ever. I ran an entire master course before I uh, taught, uh, started teaching here at the Ulrika in Amsterdam at the Sandberg Institute called Radical Cut-Up. Um, and it looked at the cut-up, the collage, the remix, the assemblage as the most dominant uh, cultural force today, as the dominant way of cultural production. And this is all rooted in getting this album as an LP, by the way, before it was tapes, and listening it. And I remember it was my father had the record player in his study room, and listening it over and over and over and over, because it was just, I've never heard anything like that before. It was violent, it was aggressive, it was super f fine at, uh, at the same time, it was um, provoking, and it, it really, I could say this, this, is, this is a day when I got this and this note that, that changed my life and, and the way I looked at things. How it also brought political context in there, very strong political message and also certain aesthetic. So I'd say this combined with the River Phoenix is where I would still situate myself until this day. Or the Beastie Boys, a group that's kind of been forgotten. Who knows the Beastie Boys or you guys? Yes, if, at least a few, but they were style icons at the time. And the way you found out about it is through um, the record sleeves. So what is written on it? Um, uh, who's on the pictures? Uh, what, are the, the, what is the music being sampled there again? Which then brought me via Beastie Boys. I came to discovering Lee Scratch Perry, who was the inventor of dub music alongside King Tubby. But he was often sampled by the Beastie Boys. Even later on, they also did a collaboration. And Many years later, I did actually an exhibition with Lee Scratch Perry here in Berlin in 2010, which was a dream come true. But he is 
uh, yeah, hailed as he's amongst the 100 most influential creators of the 20th century. He, prom he produced the first album of Bob Marley. He kind of uh, revolutionized that music or even influenced what later became then electronic music and did this kind of almost voodoo approach to, to music making and had this incredible sense of style as well, of so visually like picking up, I don't know, this whole like Bruce Lee, Blood Sports kind of vibe or Godzilla or kind of monsters. And, um, and that was introduced again via actually a hip hop album that kind of sampled him, etc. So via sampling is also a form of knowledge generating where you look up, okay, who was sampled here? What's in the, in the back lines? And then came uh, these three movies for me in this order, one, two, three. Um, they were shown on television and this was um, Beat Street uh, and then much later I was able to see White Style on VHS and even later Style was very hard to get. Uh, who has seen Beat Street? One. Okay. Uh, watch it. It's dope. It's amazing. It's a m movie actually produced by Harry Belafonte but it's set in New York in the 80s. It's kind of this kind of hip-hop, um, graffiti, back. it's a love story and a tragic story, but in, set in this environment, trying to bring this very, at the time, very, very young culture to a broader public. And um, Wildstyle being e the even more OG version of, of Beat Street is a more commercial than I said, the other ones, but this triggered for me to really um, dive into uh, graffiti art, which until this day, um, and I still work a lot with architects, with urban planners, like the city is, in my curatorial work, is a very, very big topic. And it comes also from the children books I showed you in the beginning, the Baba Papa and Seraphine, the kind of questioned ways of living, they kind of revolted against uh, systematic housing, but also this period where you learn a very different way of looking at the city, or just like the skateboarding. He's, there's a term called the skater eye, like a skater looks at the ground and says, oh, this is a good surface to roll, here it's very hard, or here I could grind, and the same is with graffiti. At one point you realize, okay, I can climb over this fence, how do I reach this rooftop, how do I get in there, etc. So you kind of hack the existing system and read the city in a different way. And that's what I still do. And that's kind of, that's what I also do in my transdisciplinary approach. But the methodology, I learned here. And uh, so again, these 17 years, I mean, you know what your homework is going to be now after this one, I guess, no? It's really important to look at. Or movies, um, Boys in the Hood, incredible movie. Um, the best uh, kind of definition of gentrification from that movie. It's, it's kind of it's like Stand By Me, but in the hood. Like, imagine Stand By Me in in um, South Central LA. Farsight, another incredible album. Nas, to this day, the best hip-hop album ever made. Um, and then, we come to the end, um, we are um, in LA. Uh, I was an exchange student in Santa Monica, uh, actually for one year, while the um, big earthquake happened. This is 1994, it was two weeks after my birthday. Uh, a massive earthquake hit. And uh, yeah, and this kind of uh, changed uh, a lot and it was an experience of uh, the power of nature or natural forces which we come to reckon with in the last couple of years more and more which we get to kind of understand as part of the climate crisis as well how powerful nature is and um, this was for probably the first time that I realized oh there's an incredible force that we're dealing with that we're living on um, at that age. So. I gave you this incredibly <laughs> personal deep dive into my first in 17 years. Just to ask you, and you're probably all in your early 20s now, well, how, who is older than 26? Um, who is between 20 and 26? Okay, so 17 doesn't seem so long ago for you. No, that's only ever three, four, five, six, seven years ago. And you may be too close to reflect upon it, but maybe you're not. So my task to you is think about these years. Like all of the stuff that you take for granted makes up who you are. Whether you reject it, totally fine, or you take it in. But in these 17 years, and there's a lot more coming, you're going to be changing, no worries. You're not stuck to that shit in the way that happened the first 17 years. But it has an influence, whether for the pro or for, for the negative or the positive, but it has a really deep influence. So for me, for example, after I showed you all this, I 
all my work is based on theoretical groundings and I read a lot and books and books and books, but only speaking until I was 17, I didn't really read. So all the stuff that came later kind of grounded most of this, gave this a context, but mm, the first drive is set there. So my task, and this is also maybe um, a, a cue to what your homework always is in this course, is to reflect upon your own 17-year-old version of yourself, or what are the key moments there, whether they're political, or whether it's a family thing, or whether it's art, or whatever, whatever rocks your boat there. And the way this um, course is set up, and also the way um, the Healing Arts is set up, that after each session on Moodle, there's a task, and you have to write a reflection. The reflection is always the same, copy paste as kind of what stayed with you, what inspired you today. And this is a little exercise, and I encourage you to take it serious. A, you have to, if you want the points, you have to do that, but you don't have to write me a whole page. It can be a little paragraph, but and don't try to be like super smart, and you don't have to be the intellectual mastermind there. Just write your obvious, like what did you feel? How, do, how did it trigger you? Um, what made it, made, it, made it make you think of, or something like that. But like a personal, reflection on each, after each Monday. Whether it's me now, today, and actually giving you a task, you don't have to do that, but think about it maybe. Um, or uh, next week um, for the healing arts, or when there's a lecturer coming, just what stayed with you. And it's, it's uh, in particular in times where we have so much information constantly um, that we're consuming, you know, after this one is the next one, and you'll be on your phone, and I'll be on my phone, I'm a complete sucker. Um, but that one moment to sit down again for 15 minutes and think, okay, so what do I remember? What stayed with me? Is really, really valuable. And this is also how you ingrain stuff, how things stay with you. Yeah, so that's my task to you. And um, this is Jim Jarmusch, movie director. He did a lot of great movies. And here he wrote this beautiful manifesto called Nothing is Original. And one quote from it is, steal from anywhere that resonates with inspiration or fuels your imagination. It's also um, something I'm trying to say is like, don't be precious about stuff. Like, take it from anywhere. Like, literally take it from anywhere. And I'll show you a little excerpt from a movie, a series of works that um, uh, were made called Manifesto uh, by Julian Rosenfeld, um, where he had the actress uh, recite um, artistic manifestos. And the manifesto that will be recited now is by Jim Jarmusch. I hope the sound is okay, uh, Jakob, here. Um, you recognize her. This was actually um, shot in the Berlin Metro Me Metropolitan School here in Berlin. And what she is now reciting to the class is Jim Jarmusch's manifesto on nothing is original. Everyone listening? Now, nothing is original, okay? So you can steal from anywhere that resonates with inspiration and fuels your imagination, okay? Okay. And you can devour old films, new films, music, books, paintings, photographs. Poems, dreams, random conversations, architecture, buildings, bridges, no trees, cloud formations, bodies of water, you know, even even light and shadows. Now I want you to select only those things to steal from that speak directly to your soul. All right? Yeah. Now, if you do this, your work and your steps will be authentic. All right? Now, authenticity is invaluable. Okay? Now, originality is non-existent. So don't bother trying to conceal your thievery. You can celebrate it, you know, if you feel like it. But in any case, I want you to remember what Jean-Luc Godard said. All right? All right. It's not where you take things from, 
It's where you take them to. Yeah, so message is clear. Um, and I think that's really important for you to take with you as well. I guess a majority of you just started and you're entering a new, totally new study program and uh, everything is very new. Um, but don't worry. <laughs> so again, also there, like, be aware that there is, everything has been done already. It's not about being super original, but it's about being authentic. But be authentic in what you do, because your take on it is special and is one of a kind. But don't have the illusion that this is going to be some original ass shit that you're doing. But it's going to be very authentic. And um, I mean this as a really liberating tool um, to, to take with you. And um, this is basically, we're coming already to the kind of the, the end of um, this introduction. There's two channels to follow. Um, uh, Instagram is post protocol which is basically where I will also uh, always remind uh, today is the talk of so-and-so, or next week is the talk of so-and-so. There's going to be both healing arts and, uh, and juxtapositions, or even on mine, no personal stuff there, no worries, you don't see any cartoon books or children books, it's like strictly, strictly work. But this is a good way, apart from the Moodle, um, to really stay um, up to date with uh, what's, what's being offered here, who's coming, or maybe if someone is not coming, this is a great way and fast way of, of communication, also for such a big group. Um, so, um, that said, I think it's time for questions, because um, uh, this is all new, you just started, it's basically your first day of university, I guess, no? Um, feel free and, yes. Ah, that's a, a wonderful question. Juxtaposition is kind of the, the juxtaposing of two things, putting two things in opposite of one another that don't really fit. It's eine Gegenüberstellung, eine kontrastreiche Gegenüberstellung. So it's a very, uh, um, yeah, putting things next to each other or opposite of one another that don't belong. And it's a beautiful word. I like the X and the, it's just it's nicely written. Yes? What are you going to do after you? Ah, what am I going to do after three years of visiting professorship at the UDK? Um, I'm just still figuring that out. I have a year to think about it. Um, I have, um, I have uh, with a, f a friend and a colleague here at UDK applied for a possible kind of research project that we're working on, which is called CLASH, Creative Liaisons in Art and Science. So what I'm really interested in is um, not only the transdisciplinary, transdisciplinary discourse within the arts, but really bringing scientific knowledge and artistic knowledge as two powerful forms of knowledge together, so that I can learn from another. Um, but yeah, so I'm b basically, I have one year, so that's a list of something I'm thinking of, but before I was teaching in Amsterdam, I mean, I taught all over the world for the last 20 years, it's just been incredibly beautiful to ride to work with a bike, I have to say, because before it was early morning flights to Amsterdam, more trains or whatever. Stuff that sucks. <laughs> this is quite nice. And it's a beautiful school and really, really wonderful to have students too. Yeah. Um, a lot of stuff that Shane said was like my childhood, and I think a lot of people may agree. It's um, aged terribly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, I repeat the question for the last row. Um, no, no, it's, no, no it's, it's good. Um, also for the online audience, I think there's already 40 or 50 people um, watching online. The question was, uh, all the stuff that inspired you and for many of the new generation here didn't really age very well. And is, uh, of the messages connected with this rather problematic or you can't relate to it really anymore, yet still it, it was influential to you. Well, Ask me, dude. I mean, program the 80s, dude, there's some very problematic shit there. Like, very, very, like, uh, uh, identity politics never heard of, male, female, I mean, it's oh, disastrous. But analyze them. Try to see, I, 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 I'm really into pattern recognition. I'm, like, look at culture as a pattern and see, okay, what patterns appeared, emerged, why did they emerge, why did they get so popular? 
like try to get like a critical view on things and still, I don't know, what's an example of something that aged badly that you were thinking of? You what? Ah, okay, interesting. For example, one thing that aged, aged badly is in uh, like carnival, and you look like a geisha or cowboys and Indians type of stuff. No, it's like incredible. This was totally common sense in the eighties. Um, yeah, but again, uh, see what um, I think it's alone that you are critically reflecting upon it tells a lot about where you are right now. But also see what you took from it. Kind of at the time. And again, pattern recognition. Try to see the culture at large, see, okay, how much, um, how much was around there, what was the ed educational standard. There was so much overlooked still. I mean, I'm, I'm learning every day, but um, there were so many fields overlooked and so many people that were not heard in your time, my time, etc. But again, I think critical eye and pattern recognition. Yeah, and don't blame yourself. Yep. Yeah. Um, I'm going to write it. I'm going to read it. And you're reading it. You'd, first of all, it's a wonderful. The question was um, if you're writing your reflections each week on Moodle, why on Moodle and why not for yourself? Um, because so this way you prove that you did it, so to speak. Um, on the other hand, I'm very curious about it and I'm going to be rereading it to you guys as well. Because after each, it's a lot of reading for me, but I, I literally do that. And um, it gives also an, a great feedback to the whole course, how things were perceived. You know, we had here lecturers where each week someone said, this was the most amazing talk ever. And, the, and, the same per and another person said, this was horrible. <laughs> yeah, I know, horrible in the way nobody really <laughs> said. But it's like, I didn't, I didn't get that. So it kind of is a beautiful way for me to see, sense a little bit Aha, uh -huh, how was the lecture perceived? And this feedback goes back to the lecturers. And that's unique um, in the sense of that, again, I've been in the game of teaching for 20 years, I never got that before. We had like superstars like Hans Ulrich Obrist, etc., like the uber, uber, uber curator. And I um, sent him the entire feedback from all the 150 students, and he was so moved because he said, in my entire career, I've never received anything like that. Just like feedback. Because people come say, hey, you did great, fantastic, woof, thumbs up. Um, but you never get like a proper personal re reflection. And that's something I want to give the speakers back to. So this is, this is why. Yes? Does the reflection have to be in English? Or can As you like. As you like. Whatever, I mean, English or, English or German, please. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah. Do you have another question? Any? Yes, I see another one. Yes, sure. Um, it's on the Ulika website, uh, obviously. You see, like each lecturer and the dates. It's also on in the Moodle as well, so everywhere. And then the post protocol Insta account. Yeah. Okay, maybe two more questions, one over there. Uh, maybe that's a question that relates to uh, more of you guys. Um, it was a question, she's a visiting student and she doesn't have a Moodle account. Um, does that apply to any one of you as well? Okay, great. Um, so if you're coming, we talk from a different university, there's a thing called a Gasthörerschaft. If you don't have a Moodle account, you can actually write me and I'll put you in touch with my colleague from the Studium Generale who can solve that by either creating one for you or kind of helping you out. But approach me directly. Yeah? Maybe you can come to me afterwards, uh, all of you that are in the same situation. Okay, final question. Or are we... Done. We are done. So thank you so much. Um, it was great having you here. And I see you all <laughs> next week. <laughs> <laughs>